Good morning. Um, as uh, Luke Sison just said, I'm Lorraine Carafel, Associate Dean and Assistant Professor of Art History in the School of Art and Design, History and Theory here at Parsons, the New School for Design. Uh, welcome to this morning's session, uh, Kuka and Brussels Industry of Woven Gold. Uh, yesterday, we heard about various aspects of Peter Cooker uh, Van Els' work, uh, including as a painter and as a designer of stained glass, as Luke was just saying. This morning, we will focus on tapestry, which lies at the very heart of Cooker's production. Our three speakers are all leaders in the field of tapestry history. Their talks will explore not only Cooker's work, but the rich 16th century milieu in which he produced his astonishing designs and made his extraordinary career. Our first speaker is Professor Guy Delmarcel, the foremost authority on Flemish tapestry. A professor emeritus in the history of art from the University of Leuven in Belgium, Professor Delmarcel's many, many outstanding publications have changed the way we think about tapestry. He wrote key essays and entries for the catalogs of the Met's previous tapestry exhibitions, the 2002 Tapestry in the Renaissance Art and Magnificence, the 2007 Tapestry in the Broke Threads of Splendor, and he contributed to the current KUKA catalog. Professor Delmarcel's scholarly accomplishments have been widely recognized. He's a member of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Sciences and Arts. In 2000, he received the annual Cultural Award of the City of Mechelen for his exhibition and publication of the Los Honores Tapestries. And in 2001, the government of France granted him the title Commander of the Order of Arts and Letters. Today, Professor Delmarcel will discuss the life of Cyrus the Great Tapestries after Kuka's great contemporary, Michiel Coxey. It's my privilege and my pleasure to welcome Professor Guy Delmarcel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and congratulations of waking up so early on a Sunday morning, what I normally never do, must say, and going through the cold of uh, Manhattan uh, to hear, hear some comments and considerations about ancient tapestry. Uh, when Elizabeth Cleland asked me to deliver some lecture here uh, at this symposium, uh, I had worked for a lot of time uh, at the part of the catalog, so uh, I realized that myself and other authors had said so much about cook and tapestry that it might be better to take another topic, but a topic uh, of the same epoch, the cont contemporary topic. And uh, so I was looking a bit to find a good one. And uh, when you make an overview of all these famous uh, tapestry series on this heyday of Brussels tapestry, uh, so beautiful about design, also about weaving, and then you realize that most of them are, uh, have been studied already in one or another form or one or another way, and that very few left uh, unattended or not yet really explored. And in this monumental study of, of the Habsburg tapestries now under press, my distinguished colleague and friend, Jan Buchanan, here present, analyzed no less than 13 existing tapestry series, mainly preserved in the Spanish royal collections. Most of them are well documented about their provenance and origin, largely thanks to Dr. Buchanan's extensive research in archives of Spain and Belgium during the last decades. However, some of these series still remain largely unexplored by lack of a consistent pedigree, by lack of documents of archives. And one of them is precisely the life of Cyrus the Great in 10 pieces, uh, kept in the Royal Spanish Collection, series number 39, uh, 10 pieces woven with wool, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. uh, with wool and silk and the profusion of silk and gold. You, you see here nine of them. Uh, it was more beautiful to show them like that. Uh, each piece has an average height of 4 meters 20 or 14 feet. And their total width re reaches to 50 for meter 80 or 182 feet. They bear the city mark of Brussels and the monogram of three manufacturers. Uh, yeah, let's see, yeah. Uh, see, uh, very uh, intricate design, very uh, uh, elaborate borders, uh, richest materials, also in details of that, uh, all uh, possible effects of uh, 
imitation of embroidery. It's wove, it's not embroidery, what we call capotage, of making in gold and silver. So really a major set about the uh, material execution or here in the borders, as we will see later on. Uh, the whole uh, background of the borders is, uh, is purely gold thread, so very uh, large set. We have two, uh, only two archival mentions about its origin and its early history. Uh, in ancient literature, in the early uh, documentation of uh, art history, it was known since a long time uh, that the set uh, has been used in Toledo at the end of December 1560 at the memorial service for the death of King Francis II of France, who was the brother-in-law of Philip II. He died on 5 December 1560. Uh, that the set went from Madrid to Toledo and back uh, to the Royal Palace, uh, to the Alcazar in Madrid. Uh, more recently, at the exhibition dedicated to uh, Michel Coxy in Leuven last year, another document appeared, uh, which what I consider quite important. And uh, from that document, we know that the suite was ready, was uh, finished, uh, woven, and ready to be shipped from Antwerp to Spain in August 1558. And that's an interesting uh, detail, because uh, when uh, we make a countdown of such a set, uh, we can speculate uh, about its date of inception and about the, the period when it was conceived. Uh, indeed, uh, no archival mention uh, has thus far been discovered for the purchase of the Cyrus set itself. Uh, uh, maybe some huge payments in October 56 and others promised in 57 for unnamed piece for total value of 13,000 escudos may refer to these tapestries. As the 10 Cyrus tapestries were ready for shipping in August 158, and as they are from a very fine and rich quality, moreover with a very intricate border design, we may infer that the cartoons design and the weaving should have started the latest in 1556. Such a weaving must have taken at least two years. A parallel can be made with the re-edition of the Noah set for Philip II. The contract of 1562 stipulated two years for the weaving, but it took one year more, because, partly because of the intricate border design of that set too, as uh, Ian Buchanan uh, has found in the documents in Simancas. According to Philip's uh, 1598 inventory after his death, the dimensions of the 10 Noah pieces, 567L, were almost identical to those of Cyrus 526L. So the two series are comparable about dimensions and, and about uh, the intricate, uh, intricacy of weaving and about their quality. Uh, and you see, uh, so we get, we get uh, an inception in 56 uh, for the design and the weaving of the Cyrus set. And uh, that goes parallel uh, at the famous year of 56, where uh, Philip II bought a lot of tapestries. It also has been published by Buchanan in the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, the late Gazette des Beaux-Arts, years ago. And in the same year, in August 56, he buys The Apocalypse by Willem de Panamaker. In October, Verdures by de Panamaker, 12 months by Francis. Goebbels, in December, the Poesias by Panamaker, of which uh, one of these tapestries at the exhibition in Grotesque by Jean Baudouin. So, a uh, real, very great activity of purchasing uh, tapestries in this period. Now, in fifth, uh, the circumstantial evidence uh, of this chronology that I propose here is confirmed when we look at the biography of Michel Coxy, author of the cartoons. His artistic authorship for the models and cartoons is now widely accepted. Some authors, as Wouters and Goebel, refer to a life of Cadmus as a major achievement of Coxie for tapestry. The source for this assessment is a French text of Isaac Bullard, Académie des Sciences et des Arts, from 1682, so more than 150 years later. No such series of Cadmus has survived, so we may accept that Bullard confused, confused Cyrus with Cadmus. Uh, on the 24th of January 1557, oh, sorry, uh, Coxie got a passport in order to move from Brussels to Ghent, where he should pay a copy of the Ghent altarpiece ordered by Philip II. When he moved to Ghent, documents uh, confirm that he had tapestry cartoons in his house. He came back to Brussels on the 31st of October uh, 1558, so uh, after that uh, Cyrus was shipped. So we may infer that the cartoons for the Cyrus set were ready before his leave to Ghent early 1557, this in 1556. 
According to the monograms woven in the borders, the cider set has been produced by a consortium of three manufacturers. Jan van Tegem, five pieces, his brother-in-law, Frans Geteels, two pieces, and finally Frans Goebbels, François Goebbels, two pieces too. So seven of the ten pieces uh, bear a monogram of a manufacturer. Van Tegem and Geteels worked already together for the Genesis, now in Florence, of which you have an ex example in the exhibition, delivered to Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici in 50, 1551, and for several years sold to Sigismund August, King of Poland, before 1503, most of them still in Krakow. And uh, so the story of Babel in this group has been designed by Coxy. A further collaboration uh, has been the series of the Seven Virtues by Franz Goebbels and the Baldacchi with Pluto and Presorpina, dated 1561, both now in Vienna. Uh, I repeat here uh, a, po a portrait of the Holy Trinity about uh, tapestry design in the 16th century. Uh, Bernard van Orley, who disappeared in 1541. Peter Hooker van Aals, who died in 15, uh, 1540. And then Michel Coxy. And then we realized that after van Orley disappeared in these 10 years, 41 to 50, uh, both uh, workshops were uh, working in parallel, uh, the, the design workshop of Peter Hooker and the design shop of Michel Coxy. And here, well, you have some of these examples of the collaboration of Coxy with the weavers of the Cyrus set, the Seven Virtues in Vienna, the famous Baldakin, dated Baldakin, 61, and uh, one of the, the tapestries of this wonderful, great collection in Krakow, still preserved at the Varel Castle. The program of such a set with a very sophisticated design and ornament has surely been well considered for the selection of the episodes. Several literary sources have been used, starting from the lives of Cyrus, available around 1550. Uh, the, the, the main ones are Herodotus, uh, the Historia of Herodotus in Greek, translated into Latin by Lorenzo Valla, the famous uh, humanist in Florence uh, around 1452, uh, of which the first Latin edition uh, appeared in 74. And another source, uh, an important too, uh, uh, is the interpretation by Marcus Julianus Justinus, the Epitoma Historiarum Philippicarum Pompei Trogi, or comments of Justinus, third century uh, uh, after Christ, on a lost history by Pompeius Trogus of the first century, edited in Italian and in French from 1507 on, and in French in 1510. And many, many editions were made, printed editions of both texts, as Herodotus as well as Just Justinus in the next years. And then the third source is the Bible, uh, the prophets, several texts in the prophets for one specific tapestry. Uh, let us now summarize a bit the content of the 10 pieces, uh, then considering their iconography, the possibility, I will speak to you about the borders, and finally, uh, we will examine shortly, then time is short, uh, its relationship with other editions and raise the questions, uh, raise the question, is the set really made uh, to order, if it ordered by uh, Philip II uh, or not, and what is its relationship with the other editions or uh, partially preserved contemporary editions uh, of the 16th century. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the first tapestry, Astyages, king of the Medes, uh, orders that his newly born grandson Cyrus should be killed because he saw him as a threat in a dream. He finally, the boy is finally entrusted, the baby, to a co-guardian, you see him there in the front, in the great figure, it's the first cowboy in art, you see him, wears his hat, eh? cowboy hat, and uh, in Persia. Uh, but the, the co-guardian gave him to a female dog to be nourished. So the parallel, of course, it's obvious with the story of Romulus and Remus is uh, obvious. Uh, we see uh, the same parallel story of the young babies uh, there entrusted to the she-wolf in Rome. On the second tapestry, the 10-year-old uh, Cyrus, a young boy, is finally identified by Astyages. It's a long story. I, uh, I make a resume, a, a short resume, thanks to his dominant attitude to the boys of his age, and he's sent back to Persia. And under the feet of Astyages, you will remark a text uh, to which we will come back later, uh, relating a bit uh, the relationship between grandfather and grandson uh, there in front. 
Uh, the third tapestry will Cyrus becomes king of Persia. He overcomes the Medes and Astyages in war, but instead of venging himself against his grandfather, he offers him the crown of the tribe of the Hyrcanians. It's an example of liberality against the enemy, parallel to those in the older deeds of Scipio series by Penny and Romano. Uh, my explanations come, of course, uh, from the, the text on top, uh, the quite intricate text uh, about which we'll consider a bit later. The fourth tapestry, Cyrus starts a war against Babylon and the Lydian with Croesus are helping the Babylonians. The Persian troops overcome both enemies and Croesus is made prisoner. Here we see in fact one of the battles without more details. The scene remains also the battle scenes in Giulio Romano's Deeds of Scipio. And we see parallels, for example, by the, the, the horse there in the front uh, with the, the older Scipio set uh, that dates from the 30s. On the next tapestry, Cyrus condemns Croesus to the stake, but Croesus reminds him the words of the Greek Solon that no living creature is happy and that kings should make peace. And then by a miracle, there is a, a cloud coming and rain falls down, and, uh, like a miracle from the sky, and Croesus is saved. So Cyrus ordered uh, also to extinguish the fire further on, and the two kings are then discussing in the foreground. The moral lesson here is to, make, to seek peace with the enemies. Cyrus and Croesus become allies. In the upheaval of the Lydians, Cyrus asked them to surrender their weapons and he let them replace by musical instruments. The text presents that in this way, the bravery and strength of men is reduced to female behavior. That's, of course, the concept of the 16th century. The next one is a very specific one. We see here how Cyrus liberates the Hebrews from the ca ca captivity of Babylon and he sends them back with the treasures of the temple in order to reconstruct the temple of Jerusalem. This may be an allusion to Philip II as the defender of the church. Uh, and, it, and this uh, scene is repeated in many uh, texts in the Bible uh, by, the, the, by several prophets that I cited before. Uh, the next tapestry, the sense of this tapestry is not obvious, it's a bit unclear. The explanatory text refers to Cyrus coming victory over the queen of the Massagetae, and Cyrus dreaming that his successor Darius should reign over Europe and Asia, and this should predict Cyrus' death and Darius' power. On the foreground, Tomiris, the queen of the Massagetae, discusses with a man bearing a laurel crown, and she points with her scepter to a messenger kneeling before him. Uh, between this scene with Cyrus' dream or Tomiris and the messenger and the next one, the vengeance of Tomiris that we will see, one expects the death of Tomiris' son, Spargapises, and this was the reason of her vengeance. It now happens that this scene is indeed represented on another surviving set, partially surviving set, that we will see later. So the harness before Tomiris may this refer to Tomiris' son, Spargapises, who committed suicide after he was made prisoner by Cyrus' troops. It is unclear why it was skipped in the Madrid series. And then the story ends, of course, it's, it's not a happy end. Uh, Cyrus is eventually overcome by Tomiris, who orders to pull his head in his own blood, in his own blood an episode frequent, frequently mentioned in literature and even painting. And there is even a, a copy made by, by Coxie uh, of an older painting attributed to the master of Flemal uh, of this episode. The text alludes here to the death of her son. On the golden vessel in which the head is drenched, we see the scene of Judith beheading Olofernes. It was a detail at the beginning of my lecture. And then finally, a last tapestry. Uh, according to the text, a very short text compared to the other text that we saw uh, until now, uh, uh, according to this text, Cyrus is constructing a bridge of ships over the Hellespont uh, in order to con conquer Europe, and he is assisted by Queen Artemisia. The selected scenes could have a moral or educational sense, a mirror of the prince. Every scene is focused on the qualities of Cyrus, but there is no happy end, as Cyrus ends as being killed by Tomiris' people, and his head is drenched in his own blood, as punishment of his hubris. The motto of the series is given by the scenes in the inferior corners, repeating on each weaving. On the left, a warrior holding a torch and standing before a seated and winged woman holding a trumpet with inscription, Fama constat bellum, or war is conferred by fame. On the right, a standing woman holding a sword and a cup of fruit 
and in front of her seated woman holding a scale and resting on a box with inscription, Regnum autem justitia et liberalitate. The reign, however, is confirmed by justice and liberality. Thus, wars brings fame and glory. The reign is based on justice and liberality. It is not an opposition of war versus peace, but the ideas, oh, sorry, but the ideas of fame, justice, and liberality parallel to the usual magnanimity of the ruler. So the idea of justice and liberality is repeated on the text woven at the Feast of Astyages in the second tapestry, where he recognizes his grandson Cyrus on the second piece. And very uh, uh, curiously, this text is literally uh, b borrowed from a famous uh, book uh, of the Italian Renaissance, uh, published in 1599, the, the famous Dream of Polyphilus by Francesco Colonna, so somewhere. Uh, and it fits very well, the same ideas, as you see, of justice, uh, of, uh, of friendship, uh, of liberalitas, of liberality, and so on. Besides these main episodes, two other iconographies are developed in the lavish, lavish inferior borders. Large medallions in the middle present the story of the creation of man and his fall and expulsion from paradise, according to Genesis chapters 1 to 3. And that goes in parallel with Cyrus also his race and his fall at the end and his death. They are rendered as monochrome images evoking golden or bronze reliefs, and they go in parallel with the story of Cyrus. On each side of the medallion with Genesis scenes, we distinguish several square scenes containing animals in action with a Latin motto. The set, the entire set of Cyrus, comprises 50 of such zoological emblems, and 49 of them are different. Only one uh, team is repeated twice. So a very large uh, uh, blend uh, selection uh, of these emblems. As former research by Guy de Tarveran and Mercedes Viale Ferrero has demonstrated, they rely on a tradition of animal allegories since antiquity, as Pliny the Elder Historia Naturalis and the Physiologus, an anonym, anonymous manuscript of the second century uh, after uh, Christ, and they got a new life in the emblematic literature of the Renaissance since, since Alciato and his followers. A same scheme of border ornaments with central medallions and rectangular animal scenes appear in several contemporary Flemish tapestry sets. For example, the life of Romulus and Remus, we saw one earlier, woven by Franz Goebbels, with the labors of Hercules there as a parallel. In these other series, Romulus in Vienna and Brussels, Antony and Cleopatra in Burgos, Life of Moses in Chartres, we, see, we find the same, same animal episodes as in the Bantrich Cyrus, but in very reduced number, and with many seats, scenes repeated more than once on the successive weavings. The question raises if these moralities uh, are related uh, to the main episodes of Cyrus' story or not. It is hard to determine. And in the present state of research, I'm inclined to believe that there is no direct relationship in their content. And where this fashion of animal allegories started, here also we have no certain response, but one suggestion is possible. On the seven tapestries of the set of the so-called Borromeo unicorn, datable also in the middle of the 16th century, the fights of the animals are interpreted by biblical inscriptions in the upper border. And in the side and inferior borders, large medallions contain such animal emblems. <coughs> According to Viale Ferrero, they do relate to the biblical interpretation in the upper border. Now, uh, the seven tapestries of the unicorn set uh, kept uh, still in the Borromeo family uh, at Isola Bella in Stresa, in this wonderful palace. It's a beautiful series uh, of outstanding quality. It has undergone a conservation treatment the last years, piece by piece, at the De Witt factory in Mechelen. They are really splendid, also of the, the highest level, the same level as the pieces here in the exhibition. And uh, these, these, these tap tapestries, datable, they are related all to biblical interpretations. There are seven tapestries. On each tapestry, three medallions, so 21 uh, altogether. And nine of these 21 emblems of the unicorn series are repeated on Cyrus, some of them with almost an identical design. And I show you some of these parallels, and I apologize some, for some uh, uh, pictures that are not so clear. It was very hard to get the details out of the, the general uh, uh, reproductions. Um, the scenes of, on the Madrid Cyrus set are as an extension of those of the unicorn set, but with a greater variety. 
that may reflect the interest of Philip II for zoology of his time. Remember that he ordered the new zoological border for the re-edition of the drone st story of Noah in 1562. Uh, is there really a, a, a purpose to give a very learned uh, program uh, to, to the set and to relate it to Cyrus or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe these animal allegories were just there for fun, as riddles. Eh? Uh, we, may, we may not forget in, the, in those times, well, to, to, to pass time. Uh, at night, you had no uh, newspapers, no magazines, no telephone, no television, no radio. Eh? Uh, how, how to spend the evenings, the long, long evenings in the castle? Well, then you could go to these allegories uh, and make the riddles and, and discuss about that. Maybe it's, it's just like that. I think it's not impossible. I give you three examples of these, these uh, animal allegories. Here, you see a deer wounded by an arrow with the text meum immedicabile in Latin, my pain cannot be cured. That can be interpreted as the deer can free himself of arrows by eating a magic plant, according to the physiologist, or it, it, it could be a symbol of Christ who saved mankind, but he had to die uh, for, to do this. A second one, also at Borromeo and in the Cyrus, eh? an ostrich looking at the stars. And the text Alta Kernens, Terena Spernit, looking at the sky, she despises earth things. Uh, according to the legends of the medieval uh, texts, when the ostrich has let her eggs, she looks at the stars and then she breeds them by the rays coming from her eyes. A bit like, uh, 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 and, uh, as a symbol of Christ, uh, symbol of resurrection of Christ. A th third one, a stork eating a snake. Nick, we come look at so that he should no harm anybody. Hmm? Of course, the stork was considered as a sacred animal because it kills venomous snakes. So there is no archival proof so that about these parallels uh, and the, the possible origin of the, uh, this, uh, this fashion of making uh, animal allegories in the tapestry of the time and here at the Cyrus. So there is no... Uh, and you see here what happens in, in other uh, uh, contemporary sets, uh, also the Romulus and Remus, uh, with a medallion in the middle. Uh, here it's not the genesis that you see in the, uh, in the inferior medallion, but the works, the labors of Hercules, and there are several of these animal allegories uh, repeated, uh, but uh, in, in another order. Uh, to, to there is no archival proof that the Madrid Cyrus set has been ordered by Philip, a lot of circumstantial evidence makes me believe that it was custom made for the king. This can be deduced from three peculiar features. The first one, in my opinion, uh, are the very peculiar inscriptions in the upper border. Whereas only one other edition contains just a short sentence in Roman capitals, as usual in most tapestry sets of the time, the Madrid set presents long explanatory texts, woven in a musical character, with a, 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 a majuscule at the beginning, and we find this only in, on Charles V's Siege of Tunis, the most famous tapestry order of the court in the whole century. On the Tunis set, the Spanish captions of the upper border are black on white background, extended over five lines, whereas those of the Cyrus are white on dark ground over three lines. In these inscriptions of the Cyrus, you have an example, eh, mention is made of facts that are not reproduced on the tapestry itself, but they explain episodes of Cyrus' life before or after the image uh, on the tapestry. And that's a first uh, argument to say that's really made uh, to measure uh, for the king. We don't f find that anywhere else. Uh, besides Tunis and Cyrus, no other tapestry series of the time contains such large explanatory texts. It is, in fact, a very archaic way of epigraphy. It relies on the large Gothic series, such as, for example, the Siege of Troy or the Life of Clovis. And editions of these sets were available in the Brussels Palace in the middle of the 16th century. A second point, a second argument that could point to a special order of Philip II is this uh, rather curious piece of Cyrus and, and, and Artemisia. It's an incongruity. Cyrus lived from 1576 to 15, 576 to 529 BC, 
But that's one century before Artemisia I, Queen of Caria, contemporary of his successor Xerxes, and two centuries before Artemisia II, Queen of Caria II, and the widow of Mosulos, reigns uh, in the, uh, between 353 to 350. The episode of crossing the Hellespont could be attributed to Xerxes, and thus an error of names may have occurred. But given the care of all these inscriptions, it is hardly acceptable that an error was made. If Xerxes was intended instead of Cyrus, then this piece is the last one of the set, and it could represent the survival of the reign of Persia following, following Cyrus' reign. The question is unresolved, but an hypothesis may be proposed. As far as we know, this episode appears only in the Madrid edition. Maybe it had a political meaning, if we accept that this set has been designed or reworked for Philip II. At a period when the order must have been given, namely the second half of 1556, the latest, Philip was married to Mary Tudor, a queen of England, who died in 58. After the wedding in July 54, Philip stayed in England until early 56, and he returned only once, early 57. The marriage was intended as a political alliance between Spain and England to assist Philip in his wars against France. So the scene of Cyrus Xerxes, assisted by Artemisia to conquer Europe with a bridge of ships, may allude to this alliance. But this is a mere hypothesis of mine, and you may not agree. We can discuss about that. And then a third uh, uh, element uh, that makes me believe that the set was made uh, really to order is after a detailed comparison with other contemporary Cyrus sets, also woven by Van Tegem, we got the feeling that the original cartoons have been adapted for the Madrid series. Well, and then, of course, the, the, the tapestry at that time in the Madrid castle, here in the Chateau de Madrid. Yeah. Okay, only two editions are cited in the contemporary documents. First, a series with gold and silver was delivered in Turin to Emmanuel Philibert of Savoy in 1564 from the manufacturer of Franz Gedeels. Eh? And as Gedeels was involved in the weaving of the Madrid set, we made it use that the same cartoons were used, the more that Emmanuel Philibert was the cousin of King Philip II and governor of the Spanish Netherlands from 55 to 59. Secondly, another mention is a weaving of the Cyrus set by Jan van Tegem in 1570 for the Landgraf Willem IV of Castle Hessen, Hessen Castle, uh, where he fled after being exiled from Flanders uh, in September 15, 1566 be because of his links with the Reformation. We may accept that van Tegem carried with him a set of cartoons when he moved to Germany. The set in Castle, and that's important, it contained, it comprised 14 pieces and not 10. Unfortunately, these sets could not have been located today. However, parts of two editions by, with the mark of Antigem are preserved. Five pieces with the arms of the Genoese nobleman Vincenzo Imperiale, who died in 67, were dispersed in an auction in 1921. Another parcel edition with the Van Tegem mark was in Wantage House in England and has been dispersed in an auction at Christie's in 1979. This one contains Cyrus offering the crown to Asiagis, Cyrus li liberating the Jews, the vengeance of Tomiris, and even more, the death of Spargapises. And two of these pieces are uh, of this sale. Uh, I could trace them. They are in another uh, uh, English noble family at Bowood Castle. The existing fragments of the Van Tegem edition uh, revealed that at least three other subjects belonged to the story, and this is confirmed by the 1570 Castle edition that numbered 14 pieces. Moreover, these other Tegem editions are smaller. A height uh, of average 350 centimeters with five Flemish L's, while Madrid fetches 420 centimeters or six Flemish L's. But despite this difference, the two smaller editions have scenes with a higher landscape, as you can see on the, the piece, comparing the piece of uh, left, which is the Madrid one, and the right on Bowood, and large, higher landscapes. And the figures themselves are taller in Madrid. And and the me measurements were taken. For example, here on the Venge of Tomiris, the tall elderly man on the left side measures 200, uh, 
235 centimeters in Madrid and only 148 centimeters in both house. And Tomirs itself, in the middle, 209 uh, centimeters or 210 centimeters in Madrid and 153 centimeters in both. And that means that the cartoons have been redesigned in one or another way. And it's my feeling that the characters uh, in Madrid seem to have been like zoomed in. And a proof of that is, in, in fact, given by, uh, by this one. Uh, also, you see the difference of, um, uh, of dimensions, the Madrid one and the Bowood one. But here you see some, uh, something um, happens. It's, it's quite uh, bizarre. Uh, the baldaquin uh, in, uh, behind Cyrus is incomplete in the uh, Madrid set, where it's complete and very logical uh, with the, the herb on the side uh, on the Bowood edition. And this appears also in the other edition, the Imperialis set, uh, where there you have a logical design with a large landscape, a good uh, proportion between figures and landscape, and a complete design here uh, of the baldaquin uh, behind Cyrus uh, here on the, the venge, uh, on the uh, Cyrus in, 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 in the Jews. Uh, by comparing uh, the Madrid series to the fragmentary other two series by Van Tegem, I'm now convinced that Van Tegem originally got cartoons with a high hor horizon and with traditional inscriptions in Roman capitals. The figures, and you see that here too. Yeah, these are uh, other figures, uh, 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 other teams that doesn't appear in Madrid. Uh, uh, one, uh, two of them in the Imperialis set and another one uh, in the Bowood set. And that brings already to 13 different uh, uh, scenes. And that's very near to the 14 uh, that we know that he wove later on. So somewhere it has been reduced, a larger program reduced for the king. The figures of these sets were enlarged, apparently by painting new cartoons for the Spanish set. And doing so, they lost a part of their origin, original design. And at the same time, extended and specific explanatory, explanatory texts were woven on top. And you have a comparison there, uh, the, the death of, of Cyrus and the, uh, the, the wrath of Tomiris, uh, a very long text on top uh, on the Madrid tapestry, and a short, uh, uh, short text on top uh, in, the, in the other figures, uh, other sets, the, uh, the set of uh, Bowood Castle, and that's more in the strain of the, the usual text, uh, the usual inscriptions uh, on the tapestries in this period. Mm. Uh, this, uh, Philip II and his entourage did not order, in my opinion, the original cartoons, but they let them readapt for the king's purpose. It was apparently not the owner of the cartoons, uh, as later for the Noah set in the 1560s, as these were re reused over and again until the 17th century. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a conclusion, you surely realize that this short presentation, such an intricate series, should need more than one lecture to be unraveled. The Cyrus set is indeed, indeed belongs to this great Brussels series of the Renaissance uh, that were analyzed in former monographic studies. This one should deserve a monograph too. And uh, we see also uh, the relationship we had to be considered uh, between the entrepreneurs and patrons. Eh? Uh, who was inventing this idea of making a set of Cyrus? Was was it the entrepreneur, was it Van Tegem or uh, Geteels, or was it Coxie? Can we consider Coxie as a pictor doctor who made that? Eh? Uh, did they conceive the, the set just for the market? Let us weave that, as Cyrus said. We have already Alexander, we have already Scipio. Eh? Uh, that's a good commercial venture. And then on one moment, okay, uh, the court is interested. No, now you will make a, a special edition for the king itself. Uh, it's a phenomenon, uh, 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 widely dispersed um, uh, uh, phenomenon in the 16th century and I refer here to the life of St. Paul uh, that you can see uh, the, the Munich set uh, of which we know that it was presented to three uh, different uh, customers, uh, Alessandro Farnese, the Maximilian II and the Eric XIV of Sweden is an error of mine and then finally uh, uh, neither Farnese nor the emperor uh, bought the set and finally it was bought by Al uh, Albert V of Bavaria and is still uh, kept in Munich and I've learned from the catalog now that the same happened uh, with the genesis of Florence that it existed already, it was not really ordered by uh, Cosimo de Medici, and finally he, he was the customer, but he was not uh, the, 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 the patron who ordered uh, to make them uh, at his inception. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.